right now because I know that when you, we start out uh, or when you have started out all your interviews, uh, they always go about uh, you know your past. Uh, we mm -hmm. all, so you are an ex CFIA agent. Is that or is it an agent or inspector or what? How do you? Yeah, say that? I guess you could call them both. I think it kind of yeah. intertwines. Um, uh, federal inspector for 15 and a half years. So, um, yeah, I worked in uh, various different uh, parts with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, I started when I was about 20 years old and... Uh, oh, right off the hop, eh? Yeah. <laughs> was that you, your first like, job? Well, no, no. It was like, I started working actually when I was about 15. Um, but it was my first uh, like uh, grown up job, I guess you could say. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, it was a there was a bit of pressure uh, with family and such to, mm -hmm. you know, but like it was it was kind of the writing was on the wall. The whole family was in the business, so it was right. it was did a no brainer. Know, did yeah. you know uh, what it entailed before you started working there? Like, did you hear anything about the stories that you know from your family, or did you just eh, it's just a job? I, it was kind of it was kind of like it's just a job like I knew there was going to be gross parts to it I didn't I did not expect what I saw that's mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. and I think one of the precursors of the job is that you had worked uh or or you were comfortable with working in that environment and uh so I you know I thought well you know I've I've seen what happens in butcher shops like right. I know it's gross but <laughs> like yeah. I, I'm not an employee, so I'm not going to be doing anything. I'm just going to be watching them do whatever. Yeah. So, and it's a government job and, you know, my grandfather, uh, you know, helped get me it. And mm -hmm. like, there's yeah, like, yeah, a few your, interview processes. Your, grandf your grandfather immigrated from Portugal. Is that correct? Yeah. Your grandparents. Yeah. How long ago was that? Oh, that was a long time ago. So, uh, my dad's in his uh, 60s, so he was five years old, uh, late 60s. Uh, he was five years old when he oh, wow. uh, came over. So, okay. uh, yeah, very long time. So they worked in a, in a few different uh, slaughterhouse factories, uh, one being Schneider's, J.M. Schneider's. It's fair, like one of the most popular ones mm -hmm. here in uh, Canada or in Ontario, at least. And yeah. I guess I would say Canada. So. Sure. Um, yeah, so they worked, uh, my grandmother as well, uh, you know, they, they form relationships with the Portuguese community because mm -hmm. that's the job that, you know, they're going to give foreigners. So yeah, that's what they offered them right when they came over. Yeah. Yeah. So terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so they worked there, they got you the job when you were 20 years old, what, where did they put you? Like, I know you, you got a CFA agent uh, job right away, right? You didn't have to have any background experience or anything because of the connections. But yeah. Where did they put you first off, like your first job? So the the first job, so um, the job's kind of intertwined a bit. So um, there's an online position. So you'd be working like... Um, sort of after everything is like um the animals um it's like it's a hard process to talk yeah. about but after whatever you're the, comfortable with oh yeah yeah okay. um uh so it would be after the evisceration line so um it would be where they've taken out the innards of the body mm -hmm. and um it would just be basically like the full chicken like if you were going to go to a grocery store and get a full chicken Oh, okay. So all the all the body parts were out, um, except it was like displayed. The innards were displayed so you could see if there's any disease oh, wow. uh, or or any contamination. So okay. it was it was fairly shocking to see mm -hmm, at first. For sure. um, but but the line speeds and and how the process was going, you didn't really have much time to think about it because you're trying to spot disease or contamination and you don't want that to go to the general public. Mm -hmm. because um you know obvious reasons yeah the speed uh i know you mentioned uh, the, the the speed <laughs> how fast everything is going and, yeah. and the quantity of uh animals that i know it's increased so what was it when you first started the amount of animals going on the line to what it is about like today i guess yeah that's a great question um so it was when I first started, I believe on one of the lines, so that's where they would kill the hens. Uh, they called them spent hens because they were at their the end of their life cycle after two years. Eggs, yeah. 
uh, too many eggs and they, they get cancer and they get um, like so many health problems. It's, it's insane. And they're, they're, the, they're treated the worst, I would say out of any animal uh, that I've personally witnessed and on mass scale as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when I first started, it was um, 60, I believe 60 birds per minute. You had three inspectors on various spots on the line. And then also another inspector at the end of the line to ensure that, you know, things were um, okay, I guess, contamination and disease were the two primary things that we're watching for. Mm -hmm. And um, so through that process and through a uh, change in legislation or change in how stakeholders sort of got into the game, um, you know, line speeds increased and certain diseases that were uh, once, um, you know, for many years, not, uh, not allowed to go through the, the system uh, all of a sudden uh, were allowed. Um, so it's, it's changed dramatically. Um, I'll give an example. So like there's something called cellulitis. Um, it's, uh, it, it grows on the body. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, isolated to one spot. And so, uh, when we first started, if there was even a, a dot on a bird, uh, the bird would be taken off the line. And, um, now uh, I believe the, when I, when I last uh, worked there, they're, they're just trimming out, um, that of the, the animal flesh. So, uh, that's just one example. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's many more. Um, the funny thing about being an inspector is that you weren't really like, you, you weren't need like you didn't have to have a formal education when I started and uh, we didn't learn too much about the disease or anything like that. We were just looking for different colors and different uh, uh, things on our checklist. Mm -hmm. um, and if something looked off or peculiar, that's when the veterinarian could step in and say, oh, this looks okay, or, or oh, it doesn't. So, oh, so it's actually a veterinarian on site? Yeah, so there's there's <laughs> usually a, a vet, veterinarians there as well. Um, so they would, uh, I would say basically there are number counters and they would actually look at uh, what types of drugs uh, were uh, given to the animals and as well when uh, dead birds would arrive en masse, they would do uh, necropsy. So um, that would be uh, opening up and examining the bird to see why, why, why they, um, they passed, you know. And, and yeah. how many, uh, how many birds a day there? Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's changed and I'd imagine it's probably more, but I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, Maple Lodge Farms in Brampton, Ontario is the single largest uh, processor of birds. So they process over 500,000 a day. Oh my God. Yeah. So uh, wow. if you can imagine 50 to 60 to 70 trucks all carrying various amounts and sometimes that, you know, that changes. So it yeah. could be less, it could be more, but uh, that's the, the, when I left, uh, how many birds. So, uh, you look at, um, 280 birds per minute, uh, three yeah. birds per second. And, and yeah. how are the workers? Like, I mean, I, I'm, it just baffles me. Like these poor people, uh, on the line. I know most of them, you said were women, right. Working yeah. on the line. Yeah. Um, just, just giving her and you can't, I can't imagine the stress, um, for one, the, like the injuries, there had to be multiple injuries. Uh, and you hear stories about some of them, um, like on W5 or whatever, like they, they can't even go to the bathroom half the time it's going so fast, right? Yeah. Uh, some yeah. of them are wearing diapers, some of them are peeing in the corner. Like, I'm not saying that's what happened at Maple Lodge Farms or anything. Right, but, right. Um, what, what was that like for, for them? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's almost like they, they're just become accustomed to it and used to it. So, um, the thing about the workers that I worked with, they, um, they had a sense of pride in who they were. And, um, I think sometimes too, it's like a bit of cognitive dissonance, you know, uh, even with us, like when we were, uh, not eating or when we were eating animals, we thought, you know, like, oh, like it's necessary, we have to do this. So I think 
much like I felt when I was working there, um, they think that this is this needs to be done. So I'll do a good job for the Canadian public right. um, as best as I can. Um, however, like the demands on them, the pressure on them, uh, you know, you, you're just you're just physically and mentally exhausted when you leave that place. I remember I and I just thought of some of these things now because uh, I hadn't remembered them. Um, driving home at night and having like like my eyes would be in, in so much pain like eye strain and I I wouldn't I didn't make the connection you know until a few years later to think wow like that's why I was I was always having like headaches and I was always like um uh feeling pain in my head when I got home it's because I was staring at this line going so fast you know and I was lucky compared to the employees there because they have to work two and a half hours till they get a break or two hours and 15 minutes. Whereas I got a break uh, every 30 minutes. So like, you know, I was able to get away from that. Whereas, you know, they're staring at uh, these birds and the viscera, which has the heart, lungs um, and, and such. Uh, so that they would have to look at both. And, yeah. and can you imagine? And the lighting there is just like, it's like you you landed on the sun. It's just so bright oh, wow. and you have to be in that light for so long. And uh, I also think, too, I was just thinking when when you had talked about the strain and what they go through, it's um, when I first started, it was 6 a.m. Uh, that was the start time. So I would leave where I'm from. It would take me about an hour to get there. So 5 a.m. Uh, I preferred the afternoon shift because I preferred to sleep and I was fortunate enough to be able to do that, um, but a number of these people had family. And so what, what had happened is they, they decided they wanted to work earlier. Um, so to, in order, and I found this out afterwards, because I, I saw some documents um, with, with the back and forth with the, um, with the government and Maple Lodge, uh, and they allowed them to start working at 4 a.m. And so if you think about that, First of all, uh, we were in an uproar. We put a grievance in. Uh, we fought it because I didn't want to have to get up at 2.30 in the morning just to make it to work for 4 a.m. Right. Uh, that's your circadian rhythm. There's a lot of uh, things, issues. Oh, yeah. And that's, for me, like, I didn't I didn't have a family or something that I had to, you know, I had, I had a relationship, but I, I didn't have to report to something, right. um, you know, or, or be there for, for somebody that needed me. Mm -hmm. However, these families, they, they were having to either drop their kids off in the middle of the night. Like, can you imagine like picking their kids up out of bed and bringing them to a babysitter or a relative or something like that? Like two in the morning? At like two <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Morning. Can you imagine? And, it's ridiculous. and, and like, and I they just, would do it, right? Because they'd they, have to. They, they had no choice. Yeah. And, and so you'd see these poor ladies, like sometimes just dozing off on the line you know with a knife in their hand oh my god like it's like wow like this is how we're treating people and it, it was just so normalized to us unfortunately it was we just thought this was normal and mm -hmm. now that i reflect back i'm just thinking how on earth like did does nobody stop this like, i know how, you look it's like how did i even participate in that like it doesn't even seem yeah real, like right? i always remember just feeling so bad for them on the line sitting there and just like you know and and i think i brought it up in a maybe in a few other interviews is like um this one lady i i talked to often and i said why don't you get a different job and Cause she had carpal tunnel on both cert, uh, like she had surgery on both wrists and like she would wrap around her wrist just to, to be able to cut sure. things. Wow. Um, and, and like, she's like, it, it doesn't matter for me. It just matters for my family. And I can't get another job cause I don't speak English and it's true. So they're like, stuck. Basically she's, they're stuck. she's stuck. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what gives me a bit of, uh, of, a of a lighter note is that uh, I recently uh, sat down with uh, Jesse and Andrew. So they're working on a, a Brave New Life project. And so that would be helping uh, slaughterhouse workers transition into different jobs. So Fantastic. Um, I really hope that's something that that takes 
uh, fold and I hope some donors can come in uh, because this is what needs to change. It's a, in my opinion, it's a human rights abuse. I think absolutely. if you just sat down and had a general conversation with anybody, I think they would think the same thing. Absolutely. Um, I was going to ask you that as well, what you were going to do oh, for yeah. the people working there. So you beat me to the punch on that one. I think that's an absolutely fabulous idea. Um, uh, a lot of people don't understand um, who's actually working in the slaughterhouses, right? A lot of, oh, psychopaths, you know, they're, you know, there's something mentally wrong with these people. That's, and that's what I heard when I first came out as vegan, yeah. right? And you started like, that's the stereotype. Just like there's a stereotype against us. We had a stereotype against, you know, slaughterhouse workers. Absolutely. And once you start digging in and you start actually seeing and getting to know the people who's actually working there, right? Like going to vigils and uh, I have a, a wonderful activist named Karen Nelson. And she hands out yes. pamphlets to the people as they're leaving. She doesn't force it on them, but they're always taking them. They're always taking them, right? And and I'm like, these are just people. They're just working. They're just trying to make a living. So they I think are. it's fantastic that you're going to do something to help them to transition out. Um, I think I who was it? It was Earthling Ed, and he had actually on one of his podcasts he had mentioned that uh, the Canadian government. Uh, Syrian refugees, I believe it was that uh, they were taken in Syrian refugees. But one of the, the one of the um, uh, things they had to do was work in a slaughterhouse. That was one of the, the catches of them coming into Canada. And I'm like, are you serious? They're coming from a war torn country, right, where nothing but murder is, is all around them. And then you're sending them into a slaughterhouse to murder sentient beings. So, I mean, that took me a while to wrap my head around that one. I mean, I didn't believe it at first. Right. But yeah, one one hell to a next hell, and and you're 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 pl playing like this like great liberator of these people, and you're bringing them into this country, and oh, we're saving them, but are you like really like? Are you really? It's it's the temporary foreign workers program in Canada. Um, they have uh, basically um, like demands of people that they can't work in certain industries. And I cannot believe that one of those industries is the slaughterhouse industry that needs to be put on these uh, foreign uh, temporary worker documents. So mm -hmm. um, I, I've been thinking about how to launch something against uh, that to speak to the minister in charge yeah. of of that, because we, we if we want a better society, we can't be putting people that are already behind the curb coming to a foreign country, possibly not even knowing the language. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to put them in this type of situation as if they haven't suffered enough. Yeah, you know? I couldn't even imagine that like, yeah. without having that background. But putting that on <laughs> the PTSD. Are you there? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, the camera, the camera. That's okay. uh, just kicked your eyes you. off every once in a while. Yeah, I know. I think it get on a couple of your interviews. They just yeah. there you go. <laughs> I, I I think it just gets up like upset with me and just doesn't want to see me on camera anymore. Out of here. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So that's I, yeah. I couldn't even imagine that. Um, so yeah, anything you come up with, I'll help you support. I'll, I mean, I'm, I'm just a little Thank person you. over here, <laughs> and I'm nothing big, but yeah. uh, you know, it, everything helps. Absolutely. And everyone can make a difference. I've, I've learned that through this entire movement, you know, even one, one leaflet can change the life of anybody. And it, we all resonate with different people. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention that. Uh, so like, I look at some of my analytics sometimes, and I, I don't have much of a, a, a big channel. I, I, I prefer to support others, you know, I prefer to help out the smaller guys, because mm -hmm. I think it's important that we have so many of us because we're all relatable to somebody else. Exactly, and exactly. so um, like, I look at my YouTube analytics, and uh, it, it's the vast majority is men that are, are watching me, but then I flip oh. the script and I, and I go to TikTok and it's 70, almost 80%, maybe 85% women. So, Interesting. um, on different platforms, we, we hit different, uh, yeah. demographics. And I never even thought to look at that stuff. I'm so new. I don't even understand the analytics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> Like, uh, you know, I, I think it, it might be for people that have like maybe a bit of a bigger following at yeah, some yeah. point to take yeah. a look to see where you can improve and stuff. Um, okay. I just I like seeing the numbers and seeing where I'm at. For sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting to see who who we reach. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm learning, too, is like uh, with activism is 
maybe uh, it's hard sometimes to be relatable. So um, when I was, so I, I've been to Fearman's Slaughterhouse, I, I can't tell you how many times. Um, and, uh, you know, I was going, uh, like, I've been doing activism, like, strong for the last, I don't know how many years. And um, I was starting to become angry and not relatable, I think, at some point. Um, I was going home, I, I'd go to vigils, and I'd just be like really upset and yeah. uh, angry all week, you know, and uh, thinking how the heck, like, can people, you know, and then, and then I try to say, Hey, look, like you were there. And so um, I think it's important that we um, start, you know, shifting a little bit, maybe get outside of our echo chamber a little bit and uh, doing some of the things we love, you know, and maybe that can rub off on people as well. So I think there's, there's a few points there that, that uh, maybe it's it's good to reinvent ourselves and not stick with the the same sort of uh, thing because I think we're always reinventing ourselves. Absolutely. You know, so I think I wasn't just, the same person I was six months ago, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a, a really good idea. Um, I, I I was going to ask you about uh, it. Kind of touches on how do you decompress? Like you have so much going on like I feel like I have a lot going on and that's not even a quarter of what you got going on right so yeah. when you're when you come home how do you decompress because you've got a lot of shit going on yeah so I, there's a few points I guess right um my laundry if if you look to the side right now, <laughs> you'd be like, what, what, is, what is happening with this person? You know, you'd be like, just oh my clean. gosh. There's one corner of your room is clean right there. Right? Yeah, it's that's it. <laughs> like, so, um, so yeah, I, I guess um, it's, sur I think it's important to surround yourself with people that, um, you know, will elevate your life. And so, um, there was a time there in my life where I was surrounded by people that maybe weren't so much elevating my life and so um, or or giving me um, sort of feedback that that I needed to hear. And so uh, more recently, uh, I was actually I found uh, I think it was January, or February. I just hit a wall and I was um, like I was down. I was like, OK, like I. I got to do something different mm. um, because I can't keep this going. Like I can't sleep properly. Um, you know, all I'm doing is, is a AR and that's all I said I would ever do. And so I had a few heart to hearts. And um, so now I've taken up some things, you know, so. Um, I, like what you kind know, of things? Well, yeah. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit of reading, which I, I stopped doing for a while. Mm. Um, I'm exercising. So I make sure I exercise every single day because our future self is going to thank us. Mm -hmm. And when I see people that, you know, had that chance to exercise at, at a much later age and maybe, maybe through no fault of their own, but I, I don't want to be, um, and especially like, cause I have some, some health issues. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to have someone take care of me. I know, so I want right? to, I want to go as far as I can, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's one of the things. Um, so I'm starting to, to think about getting back into some of the sports that I used to play because I used to be okay. a sports guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just what hanging sport? out. Oh, I'm, I'm a hockey guy. Nice, so nice, okay. uh, yeah, so I go rollerblading every day. Oh, and nice. uh, I also try to um, get in some exercise elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it keeps you fresh. It keeps you going. Um, I think eating properly um you know like we we all could be junk food vegans oh There's yeah so, so many i think so of us started out, out that way <laughs> oh my gosh i think yeah the maybe the majority of us did right yeah. so whole foods plant-based uh you know try to stick to a clean uh less sugary diet and uh yeah these are some of the things you know um so i've been uh, seeing a therapist as well um, so they've been helping me uh, cope with some of the things that I saw and how right. to um, use what I saw um, in a different light. So uh, before I would just bury everything like I, you know, I just bury it. That's the, the way you deal with it is just move bury on. It. Yeah. <laughs> Forget so about I, it. <laughs> yeah. So I've learned since obviously that's not the, uh, that's good. the right thing to do. So, um, 
uh, managing it uh, is, is what you need to do. So uh, we've discussed grounding and stuff like that as yeah. well. So uh, things I'm, I'm constantly uh, trying to work on. Uh, it's hard not to creep back into ARA because like, for example, there's a animal rights advocacy group on Discord. Oh. And um, so they, I remember when they had, I think, 20 people. I, I think I know the one of the originators of the, of the um, group itself. And so now they've moved from like 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, and 7,000 of them oh are non-vegans. And what? so, yeah, so they're having conversations every single day on Oof. there. They, so they have two stages mm -hmm. and it's so interesting to hear these amazing activists. I mean, wow. these, they're top notch. Like, yeah, I don't care what debate you have with them. They would, they Go would in. be, Bay. yeah wow. and, gotta and check so, that out. yeah um it's it's incredible it, mm. it's life-changing i wake up in the morning and uh you know i'm doing my stuff and then i peek in and all of a sudden there's a hundred people on discord uh you know many of them waiting to have this debate with a couple vegans and i'm like this th this is happening before like i'm waking up this is amazing so right? we're transforming the world you know no that's it's, i like how they're engaging though with us right like some of them yeah. Some of them are, you know, they can be assholes, uh, yeah. but the ones that just keep asking questions and keep going, you know, they're curious, right? It doesn't matter how ignorant they get. Sometimes I know they're curious, so I'll keep going and I'll try to be as polite <laughs> as possible. But what is the name of that on Discord? ARA? Yeah. Animal Rights Advocacy. Advocacy. Okay. Yeah. I'll try and remember to send you an, an invite through there. Uh, it's still, you got a lot going on. If you forget, I'll forgive you. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so you had mentioned that uh, uh, you are seeing a therapist, um, yeah. and that is for PTSD, correct? Uh, yeah, so um, I, there is a form of P PTSD. Um, I can't remember the name right now, yeah. but it's usually suffered by either people that have witnessed um, trauma, mm -hmm. like on an, on an excessive scale, like slaughterhouse workers, mm -hmm. or, or have done it. Um, so I, I think I'm on that spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so I'm, it's definitely from my time working, uh, as a federal inspector. Um, this is, uh, one thing that I'm, um, kind of very upset with, but like, uh, you know, I, I still chose to do the job. Mm -hmm. Um, there wasn't a precursor to say, um, like you could suffer mentally and psychologically right. from the things that you see. And so I, I do blame the government for that. I think they're, their role in uh, helping workers understand what they might suffer and what they might go through. Uh, I think they, they need to play a bigger role. Uh, this is, this is yeah. ridiculous. Give to, them a choice, right? To think, yeah, to think that, that people have to go and do this and they're not aware of the consequences, maybe 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Mm -hmm. Um, I was able to bury what I saw for a number of years. And then I went and worked back into a similar situation and, and, you know, it, it changed my life, mm -hmm. um, changed relationships, uh, shut me off in a lot of ways. Um, um, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm, you know, I lost out on a lot of, uh, you know, maybe normal things that people would have certain relationships and sure. stuff like that. Uh, just because of what what I had witnessed, shutting off emotionally. Um, there was a time there where I was, uh, you know, doing things in excess. Um, so like what? What do you mean well, doing things in excess? Yeah, like so I would binge eat or mm. I would uh, maybe have a few drinks, um, stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, it was clearly just to to shut off or numb whatever I was going through, and it was at a subconscious level, which is even, I think, even worse if mm -hmm. I'm not aware of what's going <laughs> yeah. on. And so things started creeping up to me. I remember um, uh, one major event in particular that I think really changed uh, the way I thought of things um, was when I, I was having recurring dreams. And um, there was one night where I actually, um, I started screaming and I actually jumped out of my bed and, you know, we had a carpeted room mm -hmm. and I actually like scratched my knees uh, cause I fell on the floor Aww. and um, you know, Do you remember what that dream was? Yeah, it, it was, um, it was near the end of my career at, with the Canadian food inspection agency. And there was just a lot of stress at the time. And 
I do remember like um, the reoccurring dream was like me in a crate and just like witnessing. Uh, it's hard to explain some of the stuff that I, I saw. Um, it Are you was, talking about like a gestation crate? Is that what you mean? Uh, or? I'm talking about, um, you know, piles of dead birds in a, in a, in a group together, like, okay. you know, hundreds. Mm-hmm. So um, it keeps, it that would flashes. Be horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It flashes. So and you still I, have that dream? Uh, actually I, I have flashbacks daily. So, um, many times a day. So, uh, yeah, I, I do have that dream every now and then for sure. So, yeah. So at night I try to, um, uh, like get away from anything that's going to trigger me. It's, it's a bit difficult, obviously, like when you're, when you're constantly doing animal rights stuff and, you know, I I think the more you get to know the community, the more the community wants to get to know you. So, um, you know, you're getting messages sent your way and and you want to be kind and respond to everybody. So, yeah, uh, but you got to shut it off at a certain point, right? (laughs) Yeah, you do. Absolutely. (laughs) So when you go to bed at night, so let's say you shut off, do you have to do anything else for yourself to relax before you go to bed to try to clear your head? Yeah. So, um, I do, uh, (laughs) I have a bit of a ritual, so I'll throw on an old TV show or, uh, I like to watch the office, uh, (laughs) Uh, something, something light, you know, something that will, uh, take my mind off anything. And then, uh, usually that kind of brings me down. I make sure I put my phone on airplane mode and, uh, all of the, the good stuff that you should do a couple hours before you go to sleep. Uh, do I practice it all the time? No, (laughs) not at all. Um, but it's a good reminder that we should, uh, you know, we don't, we don't need to be connected 24 hours. And, uh, if you can do like an hour before you go to bed, an hour before, you know, you get out of bed or after you get out of bed, uh, those are important hours, you know, you can start a a frame, like a a framework. Um, I, and I look back, like I, uh, it was a little while ago, I, I had a message sent to me and it was like a pretty bad message. I won't, I can't disclose, but um, this is what I woke up to. It it made my whole day just off, you know? So when you, when you wake up, you, you kind of want to take things in stride and, uh, have a good day, you know? So, yeah, well, that's good that you at least try to take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to touch a bit on, uh, your mom. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, you had all your family pretty much working in the slaughterhouse, uh, and your mom, uh, did she take a buyout? Is that what that was or something? Yeah. So yeah. At, at some point, um, the company was uh, um, moving into a smaller uh, uh, group of people. I think they they shut down one of their lines and uh, one of the offers was a buyout or you could stay on and, and still get paid, uh, but just at a reduced rate, which is yeah. very common for these companies. Um, uh, before I talk about my mom, I'll talk about somebody else. Um, they, uh, so a former inspector I used to work with, used to work at Maple Leaf in Toronto. And so, um, he, he was, you know, making a decent salary, something like 20 bucks an hour or something. He had lots of vacation, he had pension and all this. And so, um, Maple Leaf decided to get a grant from the government, a $10 million grant, move one hour away into Hamilton and um so they they offered him a job but at minimum wage with no benefits and no holidays so this is this is the sneaky uh ways this industry gets around they get our taxpayer dollars just to kill innocent sentient Mm -hmm. animals and so they also uh, screw people's job situation. Their livelihood, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're making billions of dollars. Nice. So, um, so yeah, my mom, she, she uh, ended up taking a buyout. Um, so she, she too kind of like had a bit of uh, social and family pressure to work um, at Schneider's as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my aunt worked there as well too. Uh, so, you know, she, she also suffers, you know, uh, I believe more than she lets off, um, you know, uh, so she, she actually had to work like her first, the first job that she worked was, um, she was, she was last in line. She, she tells this story. 
Um, so she was last in line to go, um, you know, in for orientation or whatever. And so they, they were placing people wherever they were. And she says, the foreman said to her, oh, have I got a job for you? And so um, she walks up and the, um, the door said, uh, kill floor. And so she remembers walking in and um, she's like, what, what's going on? So he's like, here's a knife. So when, when the bird passes through, you have to cut their neck because they missed the stunner or the, the, yeah, the blade. The blade. Mm-hmm. And so she, like myself, you know, uh, didn't want to let anybody down. Mm-hmm. And uh, she says that, that she would, she'd do it and she'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Aww. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Aww. And so, yeah, like I, I believe too, like uh, she suffered. Oh, that was uh, so hard. And she doesn't have, she wouldn't have never had the resources or anything like that, uh, even after she worked to help her cope with some of that. So I think she, she has other coping mechanisms. So they didn't offer anything. They don't have anything. There's no counseling available at slaughterhouses. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, oh, no, wow. it, it, if anything, it's, uh, there's something wrong with you if you can't handle if it. You can't you handle know. it. Yeah. 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 So I'd, uh, I'd heard, uh, you talk briefly about how your mom rescued a couple of chickens. Yeah. So um, when, when these animals are given, um, they call them growth hormone agents so that they, that way they can say uh, they're not growth hormones. Like it's a technical thing. Um, Just like uh, when I used to be a humane transport inspector, they decided to change the name to animal transport inspector. Uh, So so they use clever words, right? So um, these birds, they didn't uh, take to the growth hormones. Uh, So, so what happens is, um, when they take to the growth hormones, they grow at such a, at a massive rate, you know, hundreds of times their body weight, and they can't even walk after uh-huh. a certain amount of time. And so, um, these birds were actually, they didn't take to, and they were, you know, much smaller and they, you know, they look like babies because oh. they are babies, you know, they they're five, five weeks old. And so she, she took a few cause she, uh, fought with the foreman, mm-hmm. uh, and said, uh, you can't kill them. And he said, well, what are we going to do? And she's like, can I take them home? He said, no. And she pushed him and pushed him. And he finally just let her take some home. Aww. And so, uh, she had them at home for a bit and, uh, I don't think they realized, uh, the work <laughs> and, uh, the mess. <laughs> and my, I, my dad, I don't think was too thrilled. So, uh, he brought them out to greener pastures. We'll okay. just say that. So, okay. We'll say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, wow. Um, and I take it you never were able to grab an animal and rescue it, eh? Yeah. It's and at hard. that time, like, my mindset wasn't there. I remember I guess, yeah. uh, some of the uh, chickens would get outside the gates mm-hmm. and you'd see, um, you know, employee walking around to try to get them because they'd fall out of the crates or fall off the truck um so they'd be running around and mm. get through some of these spots and so it's a it was an open field there or not like it would it had grass and such mm. and like little like berries and stuff so okay uh when when you'd see one and the employee would come around and ask you like did you see anyway you'd say no <laughs> So then, then in the corner, you'd see one grabbing a berry Aww. and kind of just like off into the bushes. Yeah. Like Aww. at least, at least have a few, few days of life, yeah, maybe, you know, sure. without a, a knife hours. on their, well, without a knife on their throat. So I think yeah. that's better. Yeah. Um, are you it probably able to still, probably still goes on today? Yeah, oh, probably. Yeah. Um, are you, can you tell me about the process when the chickens arrive? Like what happens? Yeah. So, um, what happens they the trucks come in yeah so the trucks they're weighed um they come in there's a scale house uh so as an inspector i go to the scale house and i would uh write down uh you know all the details of the truck and see if they the loading density is a proper amount or whatever for Mm. that particular load and then we look at uh the dead birds on arrival so uh, a lot uh yeah depending yeah yeah like 
you know, they, they don't look at um, them as individuals. They just look at them as percentages. So uh, in order to do an investigation, uh, you know, there'd have to be at least 200 uh, dead on a 10,000 uh, bird truck. So it's, oh my God. yeah, I mean, and, and you, you'd see it. So you just walk around and it would be sort of an estimate you would, mm. you'd count. And then sometimes you would really know because it was minus 20 out and uh, the, the tarps were frozen to the truck. So they can't even open them uh, to just to give them some air. Or sometimes it would take a couple hours for them to actually be able to open the tarps. Mm. Or it was just so extremely hot out. And, um, you know, I guess we fought to try to move uh, the times that they would bring in the birds, the lengths, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we we didn't really have much of a say as inspectors. Um, so, yeah, it was they, they would arrive and then um, you'd get a phone call or you'd go down and inspect to see how many uh, deads were coming in and, you uh, depending if if they hit the threshold of two percent uh, or one percent i think they moved it to now then you'd um, do an investigation so you take pictures notes uh collect bodies put them in a garbage bag oh, and, wow. and bring them to a necropsy area so the vet could do um, how was that for you man like it was all it was awful because Jesus. um the if you go to the kill floor um like you're basically walking in a lush pool of feces mm -hmm. and urine and feathers and who knows what else exactly. and so you're slipping around um you know the the gloves and stuff the mask like stuff spraying on you like it's wow. it's all around you it's know? like a it's, horror scene right it's a horror scene yeah. it really is and and then you're collecting these bodies and you just look at them like that their entire lives uh were just to go into a garbage bag and to be cut up to see what happened to their death. Like, so you know, that, that, yeah. that's it, you know, and, and people, they, they don't see that side of things. I think mm -hmm. if people were to witness what I witnessed, I think the vast majority would be doing what we're doing today. You I know, think so. um, it's, it's ridiculous that in 2021, when we have the plethora of alternatives that people are still selfish for taste pleasure. And so that's why I'm out. That's why you're out. That's why we're speaking up and standing up. Absolutely. You know, I've seen pregnant cows on slaughterhouse trucks. Uh, um, and what uh, happens to those? What happens to the pregnant cows? Well, some, some actually give birth on the truck uh -huh. and, and they both die and they're oh. stampeded on, you know, because these trucks are coming from Alberta to uh -huh. uh, Ontario, 30 plus hours, you know, so, and they I don't I, stop I, for food or, or don't get no water. Well, they, don't get anything they, they, they stop at one spot and yeah. who knows, like what happens? I, I don't know if it's heavily regulated. <laughs> I don't know. I I've never been there, but um, I can only imagine since what I've seen is, is awfulness. Like, uh, you know, they shut off water, they'll shut off feed so they can be within a certain amount of time and, you know, you see it at Fearman Slaughterhouse with, um, you know, saliva going because they're dehydrated. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's really brutal what we do to these beings. And like we could get into each animal specifically. And I've, I've been to, you know, the three different types that are mostly used for food. And I also worked in fish as well. Oh, so, wow. I mean, like we're, we're commodifying these sentient, innocent, loving beings. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, if anything, people should have to go uh, work a day in a slaughterhouse and go to a sanctuary and uh -huh. see what the difference is. I don't. That would I be powerful. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't hear, I don't hear pigs screaming mm -hmm. at uh, sanctuaries sanctuary. the way they do at slaughterhouses. So did and you witness the gas chambers then? I did. Yes. Oh my God. So um, when I was there, they actually used prods. I don't know if that's legal anymore. Oh, okay. Um, so, the, so the guy kept um, sticking the pig. And mm. I remember saying to the inspector, why does he keep doing that yeah. to them? And he's like, well, you know, they got to get the mother. I'm like, but he's actually doing it more than he needs to be doing it. Like he's it's enjoying like he's, it. It was like he was enjoying it. Yeah. And so I like at that point, I'm just learning and I was doing uh, training, I guess you could say. Okay. And so I didn't have a say. And it, it was just so disturbing to see that. And then 
you know, they go into the chamber and you can hear them scream in the chamber. And then we've seen that since the undercover footage that shows them and we've actually, actually thrashing. yeah, thrashing and biting off their limbs and they've actually burn uh, from CO2 gas chambers. Can you imagine we live in a world where there's <laughs> CO2 gas chambered animals? No, I, I don't even, I can't even fathom that. Like I know it exists, but I just, you have well, to see it. And that's it. Like a lot of people don't know. I, you know, when, when I, so many times online, when I'm, I'm doing these common threads, I say baby pigs are put into gas, gas chambers. Uh Um, People say, no, they aren't. No, they aren't. And I say, well, what if they, what if you found out that they were, then another argument will come up. But the fact is that they didn't know that. And a lot of people do not know that. No, they don't. And that's why I think the outreach is, is so powerful with the videos. Um, I know it's a little aggressive for some people, but like there's different outreaches for everybody, you know, yeah. um, but a lot of the time they will, they will stop. And the shock is that's the powerful part for me. I mean, no one knows half the shit that's going on. They don't. And they don't. that's why we need people like you to, to come forward and tell us because when you come up, when uh, Dominion comes out, okay, or when that came out, it's like, oh, no, that's off in, you know, foreign countries. That's that's not here. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so having you to come on and tell us, you know what? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So does it compare? Is Dominion worse or is it just the tip of the iceberg? Well, Dominion's just standard. I mean, that's just exactly what happens. Um, I, people will look at it and say, oh my gosh, like, so for example, we did the unity cube of truth Mm -hmm. on uh, Saturday um, and we had 30 activists out, by the way, it was incredible Mm -hmm. and so many powerful conversations, but uh, we are using footage from uh, Dominion and uh, one of the outreach conversations I had with Caroline, um, you know, her friend was crying watching the footage. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, this is exactly standard industry practice. And I, and I mentioned that. And um, if anything, like the stuff that I witness is, was, you know, way worse than, than what we're seeing there, but what we're seeing there is, is horrific. It's mm-hmm. horrifying. It's right. It's enough to make people walk away crying like uh, Caroline's friend after a conversation. It's enough to, to have people looking and going, what's, what's going on here? Right. Or it's enough to have people go like this and walk away because they can't stand what's happening in their food system, you know? So uh, Dominion is definitely average standard industry practice and maybe even be on the light side of things. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the key word there is just average. Right? Yeah, is what I'm hearing from you is a hell of a lot worse. Yeah, I see on Dominion. Um, yeah. I guess you know, I'd like to touch a little bit on uh, what you're working on now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, um, wow. <laughs> there goes your video again. <laughs> That was a good segue. Right? <laughs> what are you working on now? Now. Uh, I'm leaving, yeah. It'll be back um, in a minute, I think. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Uh, quite a few campaigns. And um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for creating that video of me. And, like, it was just like a wow. I was, like, so uh, grateful that you you made that video. Oh, I'm so happy you liked uh, it's, it. It's so cool. It's so neat. Uh, you're very creative. and. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, keep it up. I'm, it'll I inspire. Definitely. Awesome. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. So um, people have to go and subscribe to your channel. Oh, they have to go and subscribe to your channel. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I will put so, a link down on all your stuff as well. Once I actually pop this up on my YouTube channel, put down all okay. your links for you. Thank you. I always forget to plug, you know, it's like, yeah. Uh, I know she got to like put a little list. I'm still new here. I got my questions over here. I probably missed half of them already, but you know, that's. Oh, we can go through them. I don't mind. I I set it. I set aside some time. Okay. Okay, So um, we are doing, uh, it's called the plant-based treaty. Yes. Yes. So that's uh, across the world. Um, We, we did an event on one of these days. Yeah. It was, it was just in in the last week. I know it was. Yeah. I think it might've been Tuesday. And so basically we're asking people to endorse the plant-based treaty. It's very simple. 
Uh, it's a link that you can just click on. Uh, it will go to directly uh, to every politician in your area, no matter where you are. All you have to do is hit send and put your address in. It's it's the easiest form of activism I've ever seen. So basically, it's they're we're trying to get them to sign um, or to endorse the plant based treaty. So okay. um, a planet catastrophe is looming. And we are suffering uh, from climate, ocean, bi biodiversity, and an animal crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't read the whole thing, but basically we, we need to change our food system and redirect our subsidies. So that's uh, a, a major campaign that's going on uh, across the world. There's so many great people that created that and are doing that. So I just kind of coattailed off of that. Um, Can I ask so, you a question about that? Yeah, sure, sure. So the subsidies, uh, because I know that a lot of farmers right now, they are basically live off the subsidies, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So are you going to try to get them to put those subsidies into obviously uh, plant-based agriculture, just get them to transition? You think that's going to yeah. be, how, how has that been received so far, do you think? Yeah, so um, we have seen some farmers like, um, so we have seen some farmers move into veganic farming. Uh, I know there's a place in uh, Northern Ontario as well as Quebec. Okay. Uh, both have have uh, rearranged their soils to, and it, it's all completely uh, veganic. Um, there's a company in Barrie that's opened up uh, vertical farming as yes. well, and uh, I believe they their goal was 19 different uh, plants uh, to or. or farms to open up uh, and, and do the oh, wow. vertical farming, which is great. Uh, the government actually endorsed a, a plant, I think it's in Winnipeg, um, uh, for pea farming or, hmm. or sorry, pea, pro pea processing. Pea protein, yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah, so I think they gave $150 million to that. Mm -hmm. um, so we just, we just wanna continue that. And great. those give jobs, obviously that they can, they can go into jobs. Um, so there's a place called um, Refarmed, and they're in the UK, and they've helped um, uh, many places uh, transition from uh, their farming methods of animals to plants. And so specifically, I think, like milks. Um, okay. It's, it's a bit of a different system in Canada. Uh, it's a bit harder because it's so uh, subsidy based. So the, the, these are going to be issues coming up. Um uh, I think if farmers want to get ahead of the game, I think it's time that they start considering moving to all sorts of different types of farming. I mean, there's there's so many different things we can farm, so many different plants. And um, uh, I think part of the treaty is asking that the government uh, put in money to help farmers transition as well. So uh, that would be part of the subsidy plan um, as well. Um, so that's that's one action that's going on. Also, um, I recently did an interview with Nation Rising. Um, so they're a lobby group uh, yeah. lobbying the federal government to move uh, subsidies uh, as well. And okay. uh, they, they talk about much of the same things. And, um, you know, hopefully that uh, these between these, you know, we'll we'll see some subsidies moved. I saw so. that interview. That was a good one. I like that one. Oh, thank you. Nation yeah. Rising. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great people there. Yeah. Uh, and okay, so you got that. And what else you got? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> just looking at uh, what else we're doing here. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to make a quick shout out to Malcolm Klimo Klimowitz. Yes. Um, he, he's an activist here in Ontario, Canada. He exposed uh, many mink farms. Mm -hmm. And basically the average dude was cleared of a third charge link yes. to filming uh, the mink industry here in Ontario. Okay. Uh, so also um, my friend Jen Deganchank, um, she uh, was recently arrested at one of our protests uh, here at a mink farm in uh, near uh, Water Waterloo, Ontario. So this was just a few weeks ago. Oh. And uh, so um Basically, she was charged with exposing these these farms, and uh, we've we've kind of showcased two mink farms here, and uh, so yeah, so we're looking to uh, uh, go fund uh, her uh, mm -hmm. her costs in court, and uh, I think we've received about eighteen hundred or something like that, and so. Um, if you send uh, me that that link as well, the GoFundMe thing, I'll put yes. that uh, on as well. 
Absolutely. She's a great activist. Mm -hmm. um, she's, uh, um, she's known for, for quite a few things, uh, especially exposing the minx, as well as we had a pig roll over here, uh, oh, sort of I almost the same that. area. And yeah. um, she went on and did some uh, like incredible, like she, she, she was the first one able to convince the officer to allow her to go up to the pigs. And mm -hmm. that video has, uh, I think it's over 70,000 views and what? thousands of views on, on uh, uh, YouTube and Instagram. How do you spell her last name? Uh, so um, she's Jen Deegan Chank. See the exact. I'm spelling. still getting to know everybody. I got to write this shit down. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. No here. worries. So it's D E I G H A N dash Shank. So it's S C H E N K. And okay. so she's also on YouTube. She has a YouTube channel where she shares that information. I love finding um, new Canadian YouTube channels, Okay. Yeah, and she does great outreach. We've done uh, street outreach here in the streets. And, um, you know, awesome. she, she just has such a, a great methodical way to, to speak to people and a great awesome. approach and, uh, you know, a great advocate for the animals. I can't say uh, much more than that. Uh, I, I'm fortunate and lucky enough to be around so many wonderful mm -hmm. activists. Um, you know, I was, uh, I'm, I'm flashing back to our cube, our unity cube. And, uh, you know, Jenny McQueen was out there. No, that's awesome. And, and Peter and, uh, Peter, you Peter know, who? uh, Peter McQueen as well. Oh, it's, um, that's awesome. Sonnet, uh, all the organizers of the cube. It, I just can't even. It's it's just oh, it's, wonderful. It's just so powerful, though, right? It now, really is. People. Wow. Yeah. So we uh, did a chalking event as well. Um, so in our area, we have the KW Vegan Chalking. And uh, so we do weekly events where we're just going along community trails, um, uh, at our town squares, you know, around university such, and just chalking. Uh, sometimes that uh, can inspire conversation, which it did that evening. Nice. Uh, we, we heard people asking questions, uh, asking, uh, you know, about their food choices and how they could switch and just doing outreach. So it, it really does um, even a leaflet, a pamphlet, yeah. uh, stickering, all these things are, are powerful things. Also, um, I launched a dairy uh, Starbucks, sorry, a Starbucks yeah, yeah. pressure campaign. Yes. And uh, so it's, it's kind of like a soft launch. So uh, the goal is to have people go and give um, the CEO, uh, Kevin Johnson, a letter uh, using the language that they used on their website about plant-based alternatives to say, look, uh, 2030 isn't close enough. And the reason 2030 uh, is their goal to be net zero, apparently, but they plan on doing that with dairy cows. I don't see how that's possible. But mm. also, um, if they, they remove dairy and animal products from their lineup, they could do it much better quicker so we're asking them to do that and we've explained that in a letter so if you're on facebook uh go to um uh, starbucks pressure campaign you can grab a copy of the letter make your own letter make two copies uh you know give one to the employees and ask that this letter be sent to the ceo it may get to them it may not but it's going to promote conversation exactly. and i find uh, a lot of the employees there are are very open to veganism. Okay. And so if can you imagine if a, a place like Starbucks went animal free, what a what a shift globally that would have. So, right. It's it's yeah. like trying to get uh, uh, getting the big corporations to make that first move. It's it, it sets the way for the little people to follow. Right. So trying to get like McDonald's to go vegan or you'd have a vegan burger it would set the stage. Right. So that's yeah, absolutely. awesome. That's awesome. I think I even have one of the letters up here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good, Starbucks. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's such an easy, and I think that was another part of it. It's such an easy form of activism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can like, maybe for people that aren't, are hesitant or, or new to activism, yeah. maybe it can kickstart them. Just doing one action could, could start another action, start another action. So I think that was part and partial of the goal as well, uh, to get people active. And uh, so I, I think that's one thing I wanted to mention as well is, um, you know, we have a, um, a massive group of vegans. Um, uh, I would say the majority of them aren't um, 
you know, speaking up or standing out. So I think we were talking earlier about um, maybe off camera, what, right. what inspired us a little bit. And what I've noticed lately is um, I posted a, a video of um, uh, Dr. Selesh Rao okay. and um, on my uh, Instagram account, I believe, and on my uh, TikTok and so many shares. I mean, so many people just resonate with that voice because it's a speech. And I think I'm starting to learn that these speeches do have an impact. Uh, so I, I know that Gary Yorofsky's speech, mm. uh, Earthling Ed has an amazing speech. And Amy Serrano is the one who, who really convinced me that if, if we are just sitting idly by, um, maybe we're just as complacent because we know what's going on. And it's so being an enabler. it's, it's allowing this to happen. Exactly. So if, if we know that's going on, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us feel, um, we can stand up and speak out. And we've talked about easy forms of activism. I mean, I know that people do it through food, through music, through arts. There's so many different ways we can be active in speaking out and saying the message. And no matter how uncomfortable we are, it's not as uncomfortable it is as being on a slaughterhouse truck right. destined for a CO2 gas chamber. It's not. Right. And so I think it's really important that we impress upon these, these vegan communities that um, you know, we, we can be active. And, and I think I reflect back to my own time and I think it's, it, we're having a bit of difficulty with, with doing that. Um, and it's almost like it's, it's hard enough to get people to think about going vegan, but once they do, it's hard enough, almost just as hard to get them to get active. Mm -hmm. And so like I have, I think I brought a t-shirt here. And so when I first started, and I brought this up in some other interviews as well, so you might be sick of seeing it. No, I haven't seen this one. So I have a shirt that says plant-based here. Yeah. And so when I first was vegan for the animals, I just wanted to be called plant-based because I, I didn't want to be put in some sort of stereotype. Right. And uh, even saying plant-based, I thought was put me in a stereotype. And so the more I learned, the more I kind of grew and found out like, I, I don't need to, to not stand up. And so it's, and it's a very simple thing to do. So this shirt flips inside out oh, and, it, and it says vegan. So it's <laughs> like, okay, I did hear this yet. Yeah. It's, it's just a fairly simple concept to say mm -hmm. and be a part of. And, you know, I, I do see these groups where they're posting about food and such, and that's great. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, just a simple post here and there, a simple conversation, and there's resources oh, yeah. to help you do that. YouTube will help you, inspire you to do that. So I think that's one of the goals of mine as well as other than doing my, like I do a bunch of TikTok live streams and I'm going to try to go live on YouTube and uh, help collab with other people as well. Uh, I think speaking out and uh, not missing the message or the opportunity to, to grab an audience and, and be inspiring is, is really important as well. And it's a growing thing. Like I, I would never have spoken to a camera before, never in a million years. So I, I think it's. Um, well, you're we doing learned, quite well. <laughs> we learn what, well, yeah, we learn from it, right? I think yeah. we can learn from it and uh, grow from it. And um, what I've learned too is always take uh, criticism constructively and, and you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be great. You know, it's. Yeah. I think it, that's one of the hardest things when you first become, uh, well, at least for me anyway, becoming vegan, you know, how you go through the, you know, I'm a vegan and to be active. And then you start talking to people and like, I'm vegan <laughs> and you're not. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. you get the angry stage right so i've just kind of come through that um yeah. so i get what you're saying about the constructive criticism because i notice that when i am polite back to the people that are giving me the constructive criticism even if they're a little bit too constructive a little yeah. bit too aggressive they come back and they're like they've calmed down and as long as i don't react in an aggressive manner they will lighten up and open up to a conversation with me and that's what i i've learned so far so you're absolutely correct <laughs> the anger will get you nowhere <laughs> um just a, a very violent conversation if you want one um so you're promoting basically what i'm hearing is everyday activism it's pretty simple i think yeah. even when i got started that's what i like it was covid when i became a uh, vegan right so uh, I wanted to be active. I didn't know what the hell to do because I couldn't go nowhere. I yeah. didn't do anything. 
Yeah. Um, but the first form of activism that I did was sending off, I don't know, every member of the House of Commons, I sent off letters, like all those, I, I get things, send this off, send this off, send it to everybody. <laughs> that's all I could do. And yeah. that's powerful because you're doing something. Absolutely. Right? I mean, something is better than nothing. And I, right I always, ref- yeah, I always reflect back to um, my friend, Adina, and she said, you know what made me go vegan? I was in um, a mall or something like that. And they were handing out uh, uh, little packages of food and such. And um, one of them had a leaflet in and talked about the animal agriculture industry. And mm-hmm. she's like, from that day, I, I've been vegan. And she's she's created a business line, all this stuff. Oh, wow. And, and it's all towards veganism and um yeah I just isn't just it amazing how that happens small stories like yeah. that and and people people aren't aware of how big their little action can be I, I I'm thinking back to Cuba Truth I had two three years ago and uh had a conversation with a woman she was very open and um you know I got a message maybe a year and a half later saying like they, they were looking for me or they wanted to thank me or whatever and it's like wow. that was so long ago and mm-hmm. like from that little conversation, a five minute conversation, this person could affect, uh, they, they could be the next earthling ed. They could right. be the next big deal in the world. And, and you did that. And in a simple conversation mm-hmm. did that. Yes. Yeah. When we all can do it. Yeah. Right. And, and think about all the people that you don't know that you could have affected already who went vegan. And yeah. I think that's, that's the best feeling in the world. It's gotta be the best feeling in the world. It's great. Right. It, really it yeah. makes it, 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 uh, makes you want to keep going i mean it sometimes it's so overwhelming right to see the industry and how big it is and it's entrenched in everything Um, yeah so taking those little moments and just appreciating the fact that that person went vegan or that one's thinking about going vegan you know that's that's all we got to keep going i guess right it's true and um you know i think uh when we're when we're considering uh, some of these these things, um, we can just reflect on other people that have done them before. And um, I, I'm just having a flashback to um, how we've changed uh, fur, for example, mm. across the world, and even like like places like uh, Canada Goose and uh, Saks. Even um, you know these companies they change because we we collectively uh, put pressure on them and, exactly. and change can happen with our actions, no matter how simple they are. I, I called, um, you know, I called Rudsack the, uh, you know, a little while ago, I have yeah. a little video where I, I spoke, you know, kind and, and, yeah, and, whatnot you and, and had a civil, you know, conversation. And, um, you know, like now, now we have these pressure campaigns going on and it's just a matter of time, you know, Word sack's going to change as well. So next, (laughs) right. It's just like this, this domino effect. And so, um, and then if you look at grocery stores across the world, Mm. um, even here, I just see like it growing ever since, you know, seven years ago, um, you know, I I've just seen the growth. And is that how long you've been uh, vegan seven years? Yeah. So about seven and a half, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to change. I'm going to flip back again. Oh, Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. No so you became vegan. How long after being vegan did you become active? Um, <laughs> not soon enough. <laughs> um, and that's that's why you know I think I can be relatable. I think anybody mm-hmm. can be relatable. It takes uh, a little while to to go vegan. Then it takes a little while to 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 start standing up and speaking out. So I'm not that's judging crazy. anybody, no. but. I'm showing that it's possible, you know, it's easy, it's easier than you think too. Exactly. And you're on the right side of history. So yeah, it was actually uh, my ex-partner uh, was sort of the end of my career with CFIA and uh, over the last uh, year and a half, I think. And uh, she saw that I was struggling and um, said, let's try vegetarian. And I said, okay, I did it. I was scared. I'm not yeah. going to lie. I thought something was going <laughs> to happen to me. I, you know, all these thoughts of protein and yeah, milk yeah. and iron deficiency, iron, all this, <laughs> all these, you know, marketing BS. Right? Yes. And so I, I felt pretty good. And if, 
my, if not a little bit better, you know, my allergies and asthma kind of mm. dissipated. Nice. And so I found that I was eating, you know, I, I was getting rid of the milk as well. And um, so it, it just kind of went away and like feeling like crap, actually, mm-hmm. like, I, cause I used to eat and not feel the greatest all the time. And mm. I would get stopped yeah. and then, yeah, <laughs> it was about like four or five months. I'd already been vegan, I would say, um, or plant-based because maybe right. if you're plant-based, you're not speaking up and standing out for the animals. That's I would a say good way to look at it for sure. Um, so you know, I was, I was in that realm. And then all of a sudden I said, you know what, like, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to just call myself plant-based. Nobody needs to know what I'm doing. And um, what was great is I I met some people at my work. I was just starting a new job. It had been about a year and a half that I was uh, vegan or, or, you know, quasi plant-based, I guess. And so I talked to these people that were um, this, this couple, uh, Don and Don, they're, they're awesome people. And uh, she's like, yeah, I've been a vegan for, you know, 20 years or whatever. I'm like 20 years. Wow. That's crazy. And so I saw that she didn't really care about, you know, expressing that. So yeah, I'm like, yeah. well, if she can express it, why can't I? Like, why not? <laughs> why I did. Yeah. So, so then I, I did. And then I looked into like local events around me. And so there was chickens. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I started learning about animal rights and seeing what was going on, watching the, you know, the Joey Carbstrong videos and, and started looking at outreach. And so I decided to go to a vigil. I found I was shut off, which is unfortunate. Like it didn't affect me oh, okay. uh, as much as I thought it would. Um, but as I've gone to some events, like, you know, I've, it's really affected me. And Well, I think you, you had, a, we would have had a wall, right? Because you've absolutely. been in the industry. It's still, yeah. it's like going back there. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. So uh, so yeah, and then, uh, you know, I, as I was saying before, I, I went to a couple of vigils, it wasn't as impactful as I thought, but, you know, I felt the community and I was like, wow, these people are great. They're coming here all the time. I see the stickers on the cars. I see the time they're putting into it. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I, um, I was a bit active and then, you know, I heard this speech from Amy and, uh, Amy Serrano at Liberation uh, Toronto conference Great. and I saw these actions taking place and I was like wow like I I need to stop being idle and I need to start standing because I knew I knew that I had a story right because yeah, of where I work. Sure. and it was like you know there was a bit of fear of that because I'm going to have this backlash that's going to come at me and um, you know what's ironic about that is I haven't had that backlash like I might have had a few people uh, you know maybe there was one conversation that I had with somebody on a Joey Carbstrong video and mm. there's a YouTuber you did it wrong I actually did a video on my comments with this what? other person and you know she's an anti-vegan oh, yeah. um, and has uh it was still a pretty decent uh video I did yeah. comment and say that I I liked the video and I had a few laughs um <laughs> but yeah like so you know there's there's those nuances and new, those things and I guess you just grow from it all. So yeah, um, yeah I, I, that's when I guess uh, that started my activism. If I'm rambling on words. Oh, that's yeah. whatever. That's fine. I keep yeah. thinking of questions and, and then I forget them, but <laughs> that's, that's part of old age. Um, <laughs> how old are you now then? Uh, I'm 73. Right. That's right. 73. Yeah. I thought it was 74, but no, you're looking pretty good. Yeah. yeah 73. Um, so uh, you, you reverse, uh, in age after a certain, certain amount of time going mm-hmm. vegan. Okay. It actually takes years off your life. And, Fantastic. Uh, is that yeah. like after the fourth year mark or, or the yeah, fifth something year like, mark? Okay. Something so got, like that. Okay, I mean, there's that. scales. I, yeah. I can't remember. There's like a book or something about it, okay. but yeah, you can send me the link to that book. That'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah. let's see. I know I had many more questions. I hope that we can do this again because this is like, uh, this is like my first, you're my first interview. Oh, wow. Yeah, so wow. you get the pleasure of uh, looking at me in my well, you're, worst. <laughs> you're, you're really good at this. You're an awesome host. I feel like, I feel like I've, we're just sitting in the living room chatting. So that's well, great. That's, that's what I want it to be. Like, I don't, uh, uh, I'm, I just, I, I really admire uh, everything that you're doing. Thank um, you. You're welcome. I think that uh, more people need to know about you. 
because you do have an awesome story. Um, not awesome as an EA, it's a great story, but in a, in a sense that it's going to enlighten a lot of people and it's going to bring them awareness that they did not have. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I'd mentioned it before, but now knowing you and knowing that, um, knowing the conditions that do exist, that they are like Dominion, um, that they are worse than Dominion. Now, when I'm in my cubes, and people are coming at me and they're saying, oh, well, that's just a mom and pop. You know, it doesn't happen on mom and pop farms. And like, what would you say to someone who said that? Yeah. So um, I, you know, the cubes of truth, I just love them because it's just such an uh, overwhelming experience for some people. And uh, I like the Socratic approach. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there could be p people that come out and say, well, you know, like, I know this farm is this or that or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so like, it, often people will just will use that and say like, oh, these city slickers, they don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so like, I guess for me, I have that background where I'm able to say, um, and I do catch them off guard and I normally don't tell anybody till it's my wild card. Right. So right, I right. use it. I use it at the end, you know, Smart. um, this is not how we do it on our farm. Uh, we, we take care of our animals mm -hmm. and we'll go through all the arguments. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I'll say, you know, I used to be a federal inspector and so on farms, like if, if there were to be inspectors go on farm, um, they'd be giving them the heads up. And it's a yeah. self-policing industry. They write up their own uh, rules, their own manual procedures. Nobody's really looking at them. Like um, it, as an inspector, I've never, I've, I've never um, seen um, issues of great farms. You know, all the, all these issues came to me that were, were awful. And yeah. Um, it, even the most basic coverage of farms, if you look and you look at the nature of these beings, they're, they're in, they're in metal, uh, confined concrete spaces, mm -hmm. you know, like this is not, this is not normal nor natural. So I do like to call out, uh, you know, crap arguments. Every farm is a, is an organic farm. Every farm is a, a home family farm, they all go to the same slaughterhouses, exactly. every single one of them. Mm -hmm. So, so they can claim what they want. Oh, I go to a local butcher, but have you ever been to a restaurant? You know, it, it, it's yeah. just like, um, ridiculous. So I guess what I would say, when I start out these conversations is, especially at a cube where, where they're seeing showcasing footage, um, I do like to go in and ask, like, ha have you see ever seen anything like this before? Or do you, are you wondering what we're doing? Th then they'll, they'll say uh, yes or no. So you'll say, um, how does it make you feel? Right. And I think that's a powerful point where they have to look at it and say, I'm feeling this way or that way. And they have to judge themselves on that. Exactly. And so, um, you know, the conversation I had, for example, with this uh, Christina girl, um, our Carolina, uh, girl, uh, woman, um, she, <laughs> she, uh, she, she said, yeah, like, it's awful. Like it's yeah. horrible. And I'm like, yeah, right. Like I'm emphasizing her point, you know, now that yeah. now she's thinking about, uh, what her, her beliefs are about it. I'm not pushing it on her. I'm, I'm letting her come to the conclusion about it. Right. And so like, I, you know, then I asked, are, do you love animals? And everybody loves animals. Everyone's going to say, yes, I love animals. Mm -hmm. And if, if they don't, then, then there's a little bit of disingenuous there. Right. So Absolutely. then the conversation is kind of closing a bit for me. Yeah. You want to be here for a serious conversation or don't you? Yeah, don't waste your time. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in this case, she said it was, it was bad. It was really bad what we're doing. Yes. She loves animals. And then you asked, do you eat animals? And, and like, you know, right, oh, away, shit. right away, it puts them on the reflection, the hypocrisy yeah. of what they just said, that they love animals. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you asked, do you think you need to eat animals uh, to live? And almost every single time I've spoken with someone, they say no. Oh, really? So, so they are more aware because like 
you'd think that they wouldn't do it because they thought like a lot of the arguments is no, I need to eat meat in order to survive. Yeah. yeah. But you're getting I, a lot of people that say, I know I shouldn't, or I don't need to. Yeah. And I think it's, wow. it's being respectful and framing it in a certain way. Mm. Um, that, that might not even be the, the very best. There's a, there's an activist out there called the victim's perspective. Oh, wow. If you want to, if you want to be um, perfect at outreach. Yeah. yeah. Wow, he's got it down to a science. Oh yeah. Um, wow, he's incredible. He should he should have a hundred thousand viewers, in my opinion, like okay. our subscribers on his channel. He's uh, he's great. Okay. And so, um, like I said, it's approach. It's how you respect the person, mm -hmm. and it's letting them to come to their conclusion uh, on their own, right? And so, I still want to know though, like. I ask the question, do you think you can? And, and they'll say yes. And I, then I would like to say, what's the, what's the one thing holding you back, you know? And so that, that also, they have to think about, okay, like, can I make this happen? Is, is this going to work? Is this, is this achievable? And then, you know, then I, I do point to like, there's, you know, there's 30 activists I was able to point to uh, that particular night. So, wow. yeah. Um, so you've had a lot of good experiences and I mean, I can't wait to have that many, <laughs> right? I think you I have, are. I've had, uh, uh, there was one cube. I had five conversations. I had five conversations. I was like, what? That's amazing. <laughs> right. And, uh, before that I'd had one or two and they'd been with uh, inebriated people. So it didn't really, you know, what I was just having fun with them, I guess, because they weren't really in taking any of the information, but it was yeah. good to bounce it off them anyway for practice. Yeah. The five yeah. conversations. We're, yeah. We're trying to do ours a little bit earlier. I realized like the sun's out, it might take mm -hmm. away from the video, but yeah. yeah, definitely try to do them a bit earlier. So we right. were, we're not speaking to that crowd. Yeah. And location <laughs> is important as well, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I do agree with the earlier ones because on a Saturday, people is going to be drinking <laughs> yeah, and on a Saturday yeah. evening. So you're going to get a few of those, but you know, besides them, we still yeah. do get a lot of uh, decent people stopping and talking at our cube. So that's, that's yeah, always a good feeling. I can only imagine in your area as well. Like I'm on the cusp of farm country here too. So I get it. Like there's, there's going to be a lot of uh, backlash mm -hmm. and a lot of people that aren't uh, too thrilled with your presence. No, especially we did. Uh, I went with Karen. We went to, uh, I won't name the name of the place, but it's a feedlot out here in Alberta where they, uh, mm -hmm. they, um, they grow horses. I can't even think of the right word here. Uh, um, horses everywhere. That's all I'm going to say. And they're, they're uh, shipping them to Japan for slaughter. Right. And as soon as you hit that property, um, I have a video of a, uh, a couple videos on my channel, how they just, they're, they're on you. They follow you. They stalk you. They block you in. Um, we had to call the cops last time, like three times. Yeah. <laughs> Those people are crazy. They tried to run us off the road and everything. Uh, so being a, an, an animal activist in farm country can be a little bit dangerous. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's power in numbers too. Yeah. I would say I always try to be with somebody. Oh yeah. A few people and just in case, right. Just but, in case. Yeah. yeah. Keep a GPS on. <laughs> Make sure everyone knows filming, where you're at. Filming. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. You betcha. Yeah. Um, let's see. Did you tell me everything that you got going on right now? Uh, probably not, but I okay. probably won't remember everything. Well, uh, I did, I did want to talk about it, uh, unless it doesn't exist and it's on an old video, uh, something called liberation radio. Oh yeah. So yeah, we, what we, is we, that? Okay. So, um, a bunch of us act, local activists decided to, uh, create like a, like a, almost like, um, interview style, like what we're doing here, but, okay. um, consistent with some, you know, maybe higher profile guests. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've done so. Um, so the, I can't remember how many videos we have, but we've had Jenny McQueen, Anita Crines, we had Amy oh, yeah. Serrano, nice. uh, Aaron Janus, um, and um, some others, uh, okay. Dr. Selesh. And um, so we were taking it as a, um, we want to hit the environment, we want to hit uh, our health, and we want to hit the animals mm -hmm. and try to get people to kind of come in towards the ethics of everything. Right. So um, it was pretty ambitious. We had uh, six of us working on it. And uh, the teams kind of dropped down to, I'd say, about three 
Uh, so we do a little bit like more live streams every now and then. Oh, okay. Uh, so there's a few of us that do that now. Um, but yeah, definitely we we still have it going. Okay, uh, Liberation Hour Radio, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. I didn't check it out, but I will. <laughs> um, let me just see. I'm going to go through my questions here because I probably did not ask them all. But uh, oh, that's okay. Um, so I. I know we've been speaking for a while, so I'll, I'll kind of close it off a bit now. Um, I will right, bring you back, obviously, and we'll do it live because I'm still a little nervous. You probably can't hear my voice shaking, which is great. Um, but I think what I'd want to know, if you want, what do you want people to know about the, the reason that you're speaking out? What do you want people to know? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And as you're asking it, I'm just flashing back to the things that I witnessed in this industry uh, personally and yeah. uh, the stories I've heard from people who've worked in this industry. Um, you know, I look at all these beings, animals, uh, human or not, you know, mm -hmm. I look at them as all tragic and the things that I witness um, would, would keep you up mm -hmm. at night. Uh, so yeah, I'm just trying to get people to uh, realize their food choices um, we put baby pigs into gas chambers, mm -hmm. little baby pigs into gas chambers uh, for something that can cause swine flu uh, on factory farms, uh, something that uh, has been linked to cancer, colorectal right. cancer. Um, we take uh, baby calves away from uh, cows, uh, mothers, uh, mammals that, uh, you know, they bellow out for their, their calves after we take their babies away for um, something we can swap out. We're not baby cows. Uh -huh. uh, the vast majority of people are lactose intolerant. So why are we subsidizing an industry that uh, does this? Uh, right. The males will go on to slaughter or for beef, and they all end up in the slaughterhouse. Like we we use and abuse these these poor uh, female cows to no end. Uh -huh. And so those are those are two two of the animals that suffer the most in the world, along with chickens, we, we, we use, we abused it, we, uh, the re reproductive system and chickens and, and, you know, with the, with the Guinea fowl that was in Asia, yeah. 12, 12 to 16, uh, birds per, you know, birds would, uh, sorry, 12 to 16 <laughs> eggs would be laid, uh, on average per year now it's up to 300 oh, so I know right we wreak havoc on these individual animals who suffer and chickens will suffer hens will suffer ovarian cancer and various diseases and they die we don't even have an, a, a, a definite age for them uh, mm -hmm. lifespan wise because we don't know when they die out if they were able to just live out their right. life they have to get cochlear implants uh, eggs break inside of them. I, I brought uh, chickens to the vets here, you know, like, and they're individuals if you've ever been to a sanctuary. So yes. we're really uh, screwing with our, our environment. We're really screwing with our health mm -hmm. and uh, especially these innocent sentient beings when we have a plethora of options, 20 plant-based different types of milks, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of different right. uh, edible plants to mm -hmm. eat so and they all have all the you know everything we need <laughs> yeah whatever whatever thing you're worried about mm -hmm. it's 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 never been easier to be vegan and it's never been easier to be kind to animals so right. um it's it's frustrating that we have to continue uh to you know speak out to people like this but mm -hmm. at the same point uh i was in their position at some point too right. and uh hopefully my story with what I've witnessed and where I worked, um, being on the other side of things will resonate. So hopefully that helps uh, people change. I hope so. Cause it resonated with me, even though I am already vegan, but just knowing what you've gone through and what's happened, what happens on the other side, right? A little yeah. bit more compassion to the people that work there. And I think yeah. that is required. Um, and I am going to close it off now with you. Okay. Um, but you know what? David, this was awesome. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with my unknown ass. <laughs> right? No oh, one really no. knows. <laughs> we're, we're all in this together, we right? Yes. We're all we're all doing what we can, playing our part, you know? Yeah. And and who knows? We we we're just throwing out seeds, a bunch of seeds. Exactly. And 
uh, trying to inspire people to, you know, get, get active, active, get out yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Yes. Uh, and, and next time I will try it at a live. I'll try to do a live. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I, Step I'm, out of that fear. <laughs> I'm comfortable with all. all right. And honestly, the more you do it, the more mm-hmm. comfortable you get with it. And even if you say, if you make a mistake and oopsie or whatever, like you, you can own up to it. Oh yeah, right. I said that, but I meant this. And if you're going to exactly. take it seriously, then maybe there's something wrong with that person. You know? <laughs> That's true. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> Good I guess, point. I guess I got, I forgot to plug myself a little <laughs> plug bit. Plug yourself some more. Tell me everything you want everyone to know. Okay. So like, like you, you mentioned, I'm on YouTube. Yep. Uh, I haven't posted there for a little while, but I plan on doing so and um, maybe doing some lives like yourself. Uh, okay. Uh, hopefully maybe do some interviews. I'm thinking about starting a podcast as well. Uh, put that up on Spotify, just okay. share uh, maybe little clips of inspirational uh, speak outs. Hopefully if I can inspire people. Oh, somehow. I'm sure you can. Um, yeah. And I'm on TikTok. I'm doing live streams there as well. Uh, my link tree is on my Instagram and my TikTok bios. And, uh, you know, I'm on Patreon as well. So right, I was going to say, okay. I'm looking to uh, uh, do this full time. Uh, I am doing it full time, but I'm looking to have the gas paid for, so to right. say, <laughs> and uh, be able to uh, speak out to as many people as possible and share my message. So, okay, well, I'm going to do my There's best my to help club. you do yeah. that. Yeah, do my best to <laughs> help you, you do that. Um, it's yeah. been a pleasure, David. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Yeah, thank you. All right. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. All righty. Thank you. Take care of yourself, okay? Yeah, you too. You you be safe out there. And thank you for all you're doing. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> and you're all welcome. Right. <laughs> okay. Have a good day. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.